Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, please be aware that this webinar is recording. If you do not consent to being recorded, you are asked to drop off the webinar at this time. Again, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Darby Gallagher. I'm a project coordinator here at the National Indian Health Board. Um, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Uh, we are joined today by Dr. Wong, Dr. Kumins, Dr. Rosagi, there we go, okay, and Darnell Aparicio. Um, Dr. Uh, Kumins will provide a flu, RSV, and COVID-19 update and review CDC's vaccination recommendations. Dr. Wong will discuss individual infection prevention strategies uh, for travel and gathering, and Darnell will pro provide community-based strategies for, prevent for preventing the spread and reducing stigma. Uh, by the end of today's webinar, we hope the presentations and resources shared um, will have helped increase awareness of current community vaccination coverage among Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and American Indian Alaska Native populations. Um, identify strategies to prevent the spread of COVID-19, flu, and RSV in community settings. And finally, share tools, resources, and interim guidance to support healthcare settings to manage cases and protect healthcare workers. And then I just have a few little uh, housekeeping things to run through before we get started, and then we'll be ready to go. Um, again, today's session is being recorded. Uh, once again, if you do not consent to being recorded, you are asked to drop off the call at this time. Um, the presenter's PowerPoint slides and today's recording will be emailed to all registrants on Friday. Uh, all participants have been muted. However, if you have trouble hearing during the presentation, please let myself or Adriana or another NIHB staff member know by sending a direct message to us via chat box. Live transcript has also been enabled for the meeting today. If you wish to hide the live transcript, you may click on the live transcript button, then hit click subtitle. Um, if you have questions, please click Q&A and type your questions into the free text field. Um, Myself and the guest speakers will send a type response or answer your questions live. As attendees, you can also upvote and comment on open questions if you wish. Uh, we also encourage you to enter questions into the chat box throughout the webinar. Once we get to the Q&A portion of today's webinar, you may either type your question in the chat box or unmute yourself. We ask that you turn on your camera when asking questions if you'd like. And also, if you are not speaking during the Q&A, please remain muted. If you have any technical questions, please send me a direct message in the chat box. Um, you can also communicate with other panelists or attendees at any time during the session with the chat um, and any troubleshooting issues that are, might not be tech related, go ahead and send them to me as well. Um, and then lastly, to leave the webinar, go ahead and click leave meeting. That's the last of that. And let me go ahead and introduce everyone, NIHB. Um, so the National Indian Health Board or NIHB, as you'll hear me refer to it, uh, is a nationally recognized organization created by the tribes over 40 years ago to advocate for the improved health for American Indians and Alaska Natives. NIHB is the only national organiza organization serving all federally recognized tribes and advocating on all issues related to health and public health in Indian country. We provide policy analysis and real-time communications to the tribe throughout Indian country in partnership with its members, area Indian health boards, in place and in places where no health boards exist uh, with tribes in that region. The Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizers is dedicated to promoting advocacy collaboration and leadership that improves the health status of, and access of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders within the United States, its territories, and the freely associated states. The COVID-19 and other infectious diseases Health Equity Response Network, or CHERN, um, is a partnership between APCHO and the Pacific Islander Center of Primary Care Excellence. CHERN is a cooperative agreement with the CDC and other partners, including the Infectious Diseases Society of America, Funding for churn is provided by CDC's Nat National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases. Um, and now I will go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, so we have Emily Cummins. Um, ugh, excuse me, sorry. Captain Cummins is, um, received her undergraduate degree from Brown University and her graduate degrees from Harvard. Oh, smart woman. Um, she trained in pediatrics at UCSF and is board certified in pediatrics. Um, she started at CDC as an EIS officer and has worked in various settings and topics, including malaria, STDs, HIV, immunizations, influenza, adolescent reproductive health. Um, and for the last two and a half years, COVID-19. Sorry about that, lost my train of thought. She led the COVID-19 clinical team for the last year and enjoys both 
public health focused research and shareable actionable findings with others. And they also have Dr. Hilda Rizagi, who is an epidemiologist in the Immunization Services Division at CDC. She joined CDC as an epide epidemic intelligence service program um, and the United States Public Health Service in 2015. Dr. Rizagi obtained her PhD in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and has an abundance of domestic and global experience and hopes to use her experiences to reduce health disparities. Um, and we do have two other presentation, presentations, but we'll wait until their individual presentations um, for me to introduce them. Uh, so Drs. Kumans and Rizagi, would you like to go ahead? Yes, I can get started. I want to make sure people can see my screen. Okay, great. So what is RSV and why am I so excited to talk to you about it? Um, I'll go quickly over what RSV is and then I'll address some of the other viruses that I know folks are interested in um, hearing and, and seeing. Um, so RSV is a very interesting virus. Um, it's an orthopneumovirus. This is kind of complicated Latin terminology, but it means pneumo means lung and virde means poison or slimy liquid. So I figure you might want, you might want to hear about that, that it's poison, slime, poison or slimy liquid in the lung, which really um, describes RSV very well. It's an envelope virus, which means it has its own protective coating which protects it and hides it from our own antibodies. Um, these surface proteins on the outside can help escape it, help, help it escape from our immune system. And these are the these surface proteins are the targets of vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. Sorry, here we go. Um, and you see from the colored picture that the, the red and the yellow on the top, those are the surface proteins. And those are the ones that have different functions and that's how the, the virus escapes from our um, immune system. So RSV is the leading cause of hospitalizations in US infants. And that's one of our, uh, you know, one of the main messages for today. Um, most infants are infected in their first year of life and nearly everyone by age two. So the first season that typical seasons are in the winter, um, most infants in their first season of RSV get exposed. Um, it depends on the study, but it's very, very high proportions get it. Um, the people who, are, kids who are at risk are premature infants who are born at more, more than 30 weeks gestational age. Their hospitalization rates are three times higher than babies that are born at term. And um, on the other hand, 79% of children hospitalized with RSV who are less than two years old had no underlying conditions. So they did, they were not premature. So this can really hit um, well infants as well as uh, formerly premature infants. A two, two to 3% of all infants will be hospitalized for RSV in their, uh, their one to two year period. So it's, a, it's pretty common. It hits um, kids with conditions and kids with, without conditions. So this slide gives you an idea of um, what, it's per, what the relationships are with RSV. So every year among US children aged less than five, there are between 100 and 300 deaths, between 58 to 80,000 hospitalizations, 52,000 emergency, 520,000 emergency department visits, and over 1 million outpatient visits. These are all estimates. Um, RSV is also associated with illness in adults, particularly the elderly and people with underlying conditions. So um, in adults 65 and older, there are about 14,000 deaths per year, about 177,000 hospitalizations and over 2 million symptomatic illnesses. Most adults hospitalized with RSV have one or more underlying conditions such as congestive heart failure, immune compromise, and um, people who reside in long-term care facilities where infection, particularly where infection control practices are hard to um, maintain. 
So next I'm going to get to some special respiratory surveillance among American Indian and Alaska Native children and infants, children and adults. Um, this is a project, a collaboration between CDC and uh, Johns Hopkins, as well as uh, a variety of organizations representing there are a variety of native populations in the United States. So these, the folks here are mentioned and I'll have more acknowledgements at the end. So the study design for this um, respiratory surveillance is to um, describe acute respiratory infections and what proportion are due to RSV in the Navajo Nation, in the White Mountain Apache tribal lands, and in Alaska, in two locations in Alaska. So this is a um, this started in November of 2019, and this was to get a, describe better the um, burden of disease and illness and infection among um, these populations. So the methods for this surveillance system was to use a screening tool with the HIPAA waiver. So there was informed consent from every participant, um, consent of the parent and assent of the child, if that was possible. There was a questionnaire about clinical symptoms and household risk factors. And there was a nasal swab taken for RSV and other respiratory viruses associated with acute respiratory illness. That's what ARI stands for. The laboratory uh, testing was performed at Vanderbilt, so specimens were shipped. And um, there was a medical chart review and the results are shared back with the participants. So they get their results back and summary results are shared with the facility, the NNIRB and the community. So people are more aware of what's going on in their community. As a background for this study and these surveillance systems, it's important to understand that historically, American India and Alaska Native children have experienced higher rates of acute respiratory infections um, than uh, the US population as a whole. Rates of RSV associated hospitalizations among these infants and children have been the highest documented rates in the world. The disparities are largely due to socioeconomic and other social determinants of health, such as lack of access to regular health care, lack of running water to wash hands, and crowded housing, which facilitates transmission. These communities experienced disproportionately high rates of COVID-19 in 2020 and through now, and they continue to experience high burden of disease of respiratory viral infections. So um, this system has shown, and I'll highlight here what to look at. NVSN is a national surveillance system, which gives you what the national rates are. And then the other bars are, the blue is for um, Chile, Arizona. The red is White River, Arizona. The yellow is Yukon. I'm not sure how to pronounce this correctly. Cusco Quim, Delta, Alaska. And the gray is Anchorage, Alaska. And you can see that for zero to two year olds, the sort of two month olds, three to five months old, for all of these age groups, um, the prevalent, the hospitalizations per 1000 per year is higher in each of these groups than it is in the black, which is the national rate. So you can see that these hospitaliz hospitalization rates have historically been quite a bit higher. The uh, other, um, Part to see is the um, how much RSV is detected among the inpatients. So these are um, patients that were hospitalized and they were tested for RSV and what proportion had RSV. So you'll recall that in 2019 and beginning of 2020, that's when um, COVID started circulating. And after 2020, that's why there's very little here. There's very little virus um, Circul other respiratory viruses circulating. So RSV started picking up again at the end of 2021 and then started picking up seriously this summer, uh, which I'll show in subsequent slides. <clears throat> but you can see that it's quite high among um, children who are hospitalized for RSV. The hospitalization rates um, for this is for zero to 11 months. This is for infants. It's high in all of these groups. 
it seems to be a bit lower in Anchorage, Alaska, but um, I would consider these relatively high for all groups. And as you can see, 2019 to 2020 seemed like a pretty significant year. The following year, as it's shown in the previous graph, was very little circulation. And last year, the circulation started increasing again. This year, the circulation is much higher. That is not reflected in these slides, but I'll get to one later. So um, these are the PCR results. This is kind of a gamish of all the viruses. You can see that of all the um, testing that was done, there were many different viruses. There was combinations of viruses. So um, RSV plus another virus, there was flu only, for example, um, SARS-CoV-2 only, SARS-CoV-2 plus others. So this is shows the, the mixture of viruses that are being detected by the system. And it's a very valuable system. We re really appreciate everyone who's participating in that. So this slide shows the acknowledgments of all the folks who participated in this project and continue to participate. It's been very valuable um, information to return back to the community and helps inform prevention and treatment options. I'm next gonna get into some um, national data, which will show some of it's from the data tracker and uh, we'll show um, some additional information about what the current situation looks like. So this is a COVID-19 weekly case rate per 100,000 population in the United States. And this is shown um, by dividing the counties up into um, what proportion of the county population is American Indian or Alaska Native. And the blue line is the proportion, uh, if that proportion is high in that county. And you can see from each of these peaks, this was the, one of the earlier alpha peaks. This is the Delta wave. This is the Omicron wave. This was the last summer. Each of these waves, the blue line, which is counties with uh, more than 30% of the population identifying as American Indian or Alaska Native, these are the highest, the, the counties with the highest rates. And the next slide shows um, the data tracker, which I will put in the chat after I'm done, where you can look this information up yourself. Um, this is a slide showing the case rate by race ethnicity. And you can see in um, the yellow is Alaska, American Indian, Alaska Native, and the Asian um, Pacific Islander is the sort of blue striped line, which is here. Um, Next, I'm gonna jump into uh, recent data from emergency rooms um, in patients with acute respiratory illnesses. So this is mostly children. This is national data from the National Syndromic Surveillance Program. But this gives you an idea of um, the huge increase in respiratory illnesses among children that we're seeing in the last two months. So this is the last two months here. This is a big, sharp increase. It mostly is affecting infants and young children. And um, we're just starting to see plateau in most parts of the country, but this has really been um, overwhelming of many emergency rooms and hospitals with ill children. Um, this gives the RSV weekly percent positive by HHS region. Um, HHS region is provided here in the cult bars. You can see the red, which is region four in the Southeast has slowly started to come down. Most of the other regions are plateauing are starting to go down, um, which I think is very welcome news. It doesn't mean that it won't continue for a while though, um, as we have a, a continue, continued transmission of RSV into various populations who may not have had this wave yet. The next slide gives you the current situation of influenza, um, outpatient respiratory illness activity by jurisdiction. FluServeNet is our population-based surveillance system that collects data on laboratory-confirmed influenza-associated hospitalizations through a network of acute care hospitals in 13 states. The red line shows the current season. The dip in recent weeks likely represents a data lag. Um, so we basically see that seasonal influenza activity is elevated across the country. Uh, the majority of influenza virus detected this season have been influenza A, which is 8, 3, and 2, 
and that is um, a good match with the current vaccine. However, the proportion of subtype um, influenza A viruses that are H1N1 is increasing slightly. So there's still time, still go get your vaccine. It's uh, very valuable in terms of protecting you from severe illness. It's too early for a vaccine effectiveness estimate for this vaccine. But like I've said, the majority of influenza viruses circulating and tested that are in the same genetic subclade that are in the vaccine. So we strongly recommend um, everyone over six months get their influenza vaccinations. The next is the, my last slide. It talks about COVID. This is the absolute number of COVID-19 admissions in pediatric patients in the most recent months. We can see admissions dropped to a low point in about October, and they've recently started to trend upward again, particularly in the zero to four-year-olds. And that's, that's the group that is the lowest, um, lowest rate of vaccinations. So I, I encourage you and your uh, family and friends to recommend vaccination for your um, loved ones and uh, your family and friends to help reduce the burden of disease. I'm happy to take any questions, but I'm, I think um, Hilda, was, you were gonna go next, right? About vaccinations? Yes. Great. Thank you. I'll turn mine off. Um, bef before you go, Dr. Rizagi, Dr. Cummins, can you answer the question from the Q&A box? Was RSV being tested during 2021? Yes, RSV was being tested. So um, the um, this is the true for almost all surveillance systems. It was very little, um, very little circulation of other respiratory viruses. So we were looking for it, but we didn't see it. And I will put the, the CDC data tracker um, link in the chat so people can look up things. It's, it's full of very rich data. Great, thanks. Well, great. Thank you for the segue. Um, so I am Hilda Razagi, and I will be discussing COVID-19 vaccination coverage to date with a focus on race and ethnicity, as well as walking through the current recommendations for COVID-19 vaccines. Next, please. I know this is a busy slide. I'll walk through this and then I'll provide the link from um, CDC's COVID data tracker and chat for those of you who would like to go and take further look into this. So this slide displays COVID-19 vaccination coverage from administrations reported directly to CDC by jurisdictions and federal entities from December 14th, 2020 through November 30th, 2022. Percentages displayed in these charts represent the percent of vaccine recipients in each racial and ethnic group for whom race and ethnicity data are known. As noted in these circles on this figure, race and ethnicity is not available for about a quarter of people who received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, for about 20% of people who completed the primary series, and about 12% of people who received the updated bivalent booster. Therefore, the percentages by race and ethnicity are significantly underestimated. These three figures uh, that are displayed include vaccinations over time for all three measures, including receipt of at least one dose, completed primary series, and receipt of a bivalent booster dose. I will highlight coverage with the updated bivalent booster dose, given that that's the most um, recent vaccine that was authorized for use. As shown on the figure to the right, the last of the three charts, based on administration's data to CDC since September 1st, 2022, when this vaccine was authorized, close to 15% of um, non-Hispanic Asian population, about 10% of American Indian Alaska Natives, and about 8% of Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islanders have received a bivalent booster. Again, this data is available on CDC's COVID data tracker, and it does get updated every week on Thursday. And I'll put the link to this figure in the chat after the presentation. Next, please. CDC also provides information on self-reported COVID-19 vaccination status by race and ethnicity from the National Immunization Survey's adult COVID module in order to supplement vaccine administration data that are reported directly to CDC by jurisdictions and federal entities. 
self-reported race and ethnicity is only missing for about 4% of respondents in the National Immunization Survey. Percentages displayed in this slide represent the estimated percent of people in each racial and ethnic group who reported receiving COVID-19 vaccines on the survey. One difference to note is that receipt of updated bivalent boosters from survey data is reported among those who completed a primary series of COVID-19 vaccines. As shown on the chart again to your right, based on the survey data, as of October 29th, among adults 18 years of age and older, about 23% of Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islanders, about 13% of non-Hispanic Asian population, and a little over 13% of American Indian Alaska Natives reported receiving an updated bivalent booster vaccine. Again, this chart is posted on COVID Data Tracker and it gets updated monthly. Um, there's also a link in this figure to COVID Vax Views, where all of the NIS, the National Immunization Service data sets for both adult and um, COVID um, child, uh, child COVID module, which is a, another rich source of data. Next, please. So uh, in the next few slides, I'll cover the standard schedule, which is for people who are not moderately or severely immunocompromised. Recommendations are a little different for people who are moderately or severely in, uh, immunocompromised, which I will not walk through today for the sake of time, but they will be included as additional slides that will be shared um, on Friday. Next slide, please. So for children ages six months through four years, they are recommended to receive either a two-dose Moderna primary series separated by four to eight weeks or a three-dose Pfizer primary series. Doses one and two are separated by three to eight weeks and dose two and three by at least eight weeks. Next slide, please. Children ages five years through 11 are recommended to receive either a two-dose Moderna or Pfizer primary series. Doses are separated by four to eight weeks if Moderna and three to eight weeks if Pfizer. A bivalent booster dose is recommended to this group at least two months after completion of primary series or last monovalent booster dose. For those ages five years, only a Pfizer bivalent can be given. And for those six through 11, either a Pfizer or Moderna bivalent booster can be given. Next slide, please. Adolescents ages 12 through 17 are recommended to receive a two-dose primary series of either Moderna, Novavax, or Pfizer. The primary series is separated by four to eight weeks of Moderna and three to eight weeks of Novavax or Pfizer. Regardless of the primary series of either Pfizer or Moderna, uh, uh, regardless of primary series, either a Pfizer or Moderna bivalent booster is recommended at least two months after completion of the primary series or receipt of the last monovalent booster dose. Next, please. Finally, adults ages 18 years or older have the same recommendations that I just mentioned of a two-dose primary series of either Moderna, Novavax, or Pfizer. And regardless of the primary series, an either Pfizer or Moderna bivalent booster is recommended at least two months after the completion of primary series or receipt of last monovalent booster dose. Janssen is an option in limited situations. This is an only one primary dose followed by a bivalent booster dose at least two months later. Next slide, please. If a person 18 years or older who has not received any previous booster dose is unable or unwilling to get a bivalent mRNA booster, they can get a monovalent Novavax booster dose instead. And that will be at least six months after the completion of primary series. Next slide, please. An mRNA bivalent booster is the default recommendation for everyone ages five years and older. Novavax monovalent booster is an acceptable option where the patient is unable or unwilling to receive the default in people 18 years of age or older. And my final slide, please. And to summarize, CDC continues to encourage people to stay up to date with their COVID-19 vaccines. Staying up to date keeps people current with COVID-19 vaccine recommendations. 
With new recommendations, people are up to date if they have completed a primary series and received the most recent booster dose recommended for them by CDC. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Kara. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rizagi. We did have one question and it's what vaccine is given to children five years and younger? So for children five years and younger, uh, both Pfizer and Moderna are authorized. Pfizer is three doses, Moderna is two doses. Great, thank you. And I'll pass it back to Darby. Thank you. Okay, so I will just introduce um, quickly our next two presenters. We have Dr. Wong, uh, who is an infectious disease specialist at International Community Health Services and Virginia Mason Medical Center. Um, additionally, Dr. Wong is a clinical associate professor of medicine at the University of Washington. Um, and then we have Darnell Aparicio, um, who is a public health outreach manager at Lake County Tribal Health Consortium. Uh, he is a member of the Manchester Point Arena Band of Pomo Indians, sorry about that. Um, and he is pursuing a bachelor's of science in nursing with an emphasis on public health. Um, and Dr. Wong, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, thanks so much. So I am a practicing infectious diseases doctor here in Seattle, Washington. I see adult patients uh, and not pediatric patients so much. So I'm, I'm certainly no expert in RSV. Um, and I was asked to address some sort of uh, practical considerations regarding these viruses and specifically focusing on travel and gatherings. Next slide. Uh, so the outline of my talk is here. I'm gonna try to keep it to, um, well, 10 minutes if I can, I'll give Darnell 15 minutes. Uh, so I was, I, again, uh, the speakers ahead of me have already really talked about the viruses and trends, and so I will focus more on sort of some practical aspects here from the front lines, and then talk a little bit about travel and gatherings. Next slide. Sometimes it feels like it's raining viruses, at least uh, to me here in Seattle, where it rains all the time, uh, it, it seems like it's raining viruses, and so I think it's helpful to kind of to talk about uh, the three that are most prevalent right now in terms of respiratory viruses and see what we can do to uh, differentiate them. Next slide. So we've already had an excellent review on the virology of RSV, um, and I won't get into the virology of flu and coronavirus in the interest of time, only to say that these are all RNA viruses, respiratory viruses that bind to our respiratory cells uh, via various uh, fusion proteins or spike proteins. Transmission is actually a little tricky, um, but I've sort of tried to simplify it here to say that RSV, we really think of that as droplet and flu, uh, community flu right now, flu A, we think of as droplet as well. And by droplet, we mean like these heavy drops that come out of your mouth when we cough, um, but don't travel very far and tend to fall to the ground. That's to differentiate it from airborne um, with COVID, you know, we think of that as more of an airborne, but it's kind of a special airborne virus and that, at least here in the hospital, we providers will wear an N95 when we go in to see the patients, but the patients don't need to be in a negative pressure room. Uh, for example, if somebody had tuberculosis, they would be in a room uh, that was a negative pressure room to prevent the air from that room from going out into the hospital corridors and so forth. And we don't necessarily put our COVID patients in those rooms. Why is that important to know? Well, I think it's helpful to think about in terms of when we think about how we protect ourselves from these viruses and, uh, and how they spread from person to person. In terms of treatment and prevention, uh, I think it's important to highlight for our community members that there is treatment for both flu and COVID specific antiviral treatment. Whereas with RSV, it's more supportive care and the hospitalizations that we just saw uh, those hospitalizations, again, I'm not a pediatrician, but my understanding is it's really for supportive care to provide oxygen and, and fluids and so forth until the patient is feeling better. Um, but for flu, we do have a antiviral medication that I think many people are familiar with. It's called Tamiflu or Oseltamivir. Uh, we do have other antivirals as well that we can sometimes use in the hospital. Uh, but currently there's a shortage of Tamiflu because the uh, flu season came early and strong as, as we just saw from those numbers and 
um, the manufacturers who, which tend to manufacture the oseltamivir when it's needed uh, were sort of caught a little bit behind the eight ball. So I'm hoping that this shortage will soon be alleviated. I'm on call this weekend. I just checked to see at our hospital, we have 75 doses of Tamiflu. So uh, if we get anybody admitted, uh, we'll be able to treat them at least. Um, and then with regards to COVID, uh, we also know that there are antivirals that we can use. Um, the one that's most well known is Paxlovid, which is a pill that you take uh, usually as outpatient. Um, but there's been a little bit of a change to what's available to us uh, in terms of treatment of COVID. So I was gonna go over that briefly. And then interestingly, you know, I think for community members, again, people who are on the front lines, we diagnose all these viruses the same way, mostly by a nasal swab, sometimes by an oral swab, but usually by a nasal swab. And we have a rapid antigen and PCR test available to us. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but recently my kids, I have 14 year old twins and they both recently were very sick with the respiratory virus. And I really wanted to know as an ID doc, I wanted to know if they had RSV. I was curious, just for curiosity, they were, they were doing fine, but um, had no way of diagnosing it at home. So, and I didn't, they weren't sick enough for me to bring them in. So even for an ID doc, we cannot always tell, um, you know, based on symptoms, whether a person has RSV or flu or COVID. Next slide. There is a uh, combination test available to be used at home. Uh, it's something that you would buy online and then you would collect the swab and then you would send it in. So it takes like two to three days to get the result. Uh, we also have one here in the hospital, obviously, that we use in our ER in, in the hospital, uh, but it's, it's not readily available. We're so used to being able to test for COVID at home, and which was so great. You test before you go see grandma, but we, this uh, sort of combination test is not widely available. This one costs $169 and you can get reimbursed from your insurance if you meet the criteria, basically, if a doctor has re recommended that you get the test. But because the answer comes back, you know, three days later or even longer, depending on where you live, um, that's not really useful before you go see grandma. So it's, it's more for curiosity, but hopefully because the tests are all similar that uh, hopefully in the future, we will have something that we can use at home, sort of like we can use the COVID test right now. Next slide. So this is a busy slide and I really just put it on there to show that these three viruses present very similarly. And so, like I said, even for an ID talk, I, could, I would not really put money on my own a guess sometimes in terms of which virus is causing disease in any patient that's in front of me. Next slide. But I did want to highlight a few things just for those who, who may want to just get some idea of what the patient or your family member or you yourself might have. So one thing about flu is that it tends to come on pretty quickly. Like, you know, you start the day, you feel fine. At around four o'clock, you feel terrible. That's sort of the, the story that you hear with flu less so with RSV and COVID that kind of creep up on you a little bit. With RSV, uh, it doesn't cause so much the terrible, terrible body aches that we have heard described by patients who have flu or COVID, but both flu and COVID can cause terrible body aches. And with COVID, um, with the nasal congestion, it's not as prominent, although I, I will say that I've noticed that in 2022, it seems like sore throat is more of a common symptom that I'm hearing from my COVID patients that I did hear back in 2020 and 2021. Um, shortness of breath, you can see is a little bit more common with flu and COVID. And then of course, we've all heard about the loss of taste or smell, which seems to be just unique to COVID. Um, not everybody with COVID will have those, but if you, if you have those, then you more likely have COVID than one of these other viruses. Next slide. And we just saw some numbers about flu, so I won't harp on this, only to say that it, the, the curve, the orange curve, has just gone up very, very quickly and earlier than we would expect. Next slide. Uh, this is again from the CDC data tracker, although I got this off the New York Times website uh, that shows the, uh, the rates from the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, you can see that huge peak in the uh, winter, this past winter, which was related to Omicron. And you can see that we are nowhere close to that peak right now, and we hope to keep it that way hopefully with the bivalent booster, as well as some level of natural immunity in our population, we're, we're not going to see a peak like that again with this current variant that's circulating. Next slide. And then this is the 90-day data tracker. And if you look at the curve, the red line, you can see that in terms of um, cases, test positivity rate down below and hospitalizations, there's a little bit of an upswing there. It's still early in the holiday season, but there's a little bit of an upswing. So it's yet, we are yet to see 
how that's going to end up. But hopefully that upswing will not be too steep and not be too persistent. Next slide. Uh, we just heard about RSV, so I just want to say that it looks like finally we had a huge peak. Uh, this is a, a graph from Washington State, uh, but finally it looks like those numbers are starting to come down, although rates are still high. Next slide. So in summary for this part of my talk, um, how can you tell if it's flu or COVID or RSV? Very difficult. Really, the only way, only way to know for sure is to do a test. Flu rates are higher than for COVID and RSV at this time. Flu rates are very, very high. So we really need to be telling our patients to go out and get vaccinated. Um, we're starting to see a slight increase in COVID rates. And fortunately, RSV rates are starting to come down, but are still high. Next slide. Treatment for flu is listed here, and I won't go through all of it, only to say that oseltamivir is, um, is something that we can use that shortens the duration of illness a little bit by uh, like a day or so. So it's not to say that if you have flu that you need to get oseltamivir, but it is something that we have in our armamentarium. And so if you have a patient who has severe flu or one who has other chronic medical conditions and has the flu, that would be the appropriate patient to refer for oseltamivir. Next slide. RSV is symptomatic management only. And then there are some treatments that are sometimes used in immune compromised patients. And then uh, I'm sure the folks from the CDC know more about this than I do, but I was just reading that there is uh, a really promising vaccine that's currently in advanced stages of development. And so hopefully we'll be able to, to boast a vaccine for RSV soon in the next year or so. Next slide. And then again, the folks from the CDC, um, please speak to this if, if uh, I say something incorrectly, but when it comes to the flu vaccine, I think there's a change this year and that is specifically recommended for those who are 65 and older to get either a high dose flu vaccine, which we have given to older patients before, but we also have these adjuvant containing flu vaccines uh, so that it's recommended that a patient who is age 65 or older get one of those rather than just a standard dose flu vaccine, which doesn't contain the adjuvant. And just to be clear, an adjuvant is something that's added to a vaccine to make it more immunogenic. So it's something that isn't necessarily part of the virus that you're trying to vaccinate against, but it's something that kind of tickles the immune system so that the immune system responds more strongly to the virus that you're trying to vaccinate against. And the idea is that for folks 65 and older, the immune system is not quite as active as it is for a younger person. And so it needs sort of an extra little boost, either from a higher dose or from an adjuvant containing vaccine. And I also saw that Dr. Walensky um, in an interview said that it appears that we have a 90, 92 to 95% match um, for, with the vac between the vaccine and the circulating strain of influenza A. So that's great. As I mentioned, it's too early to talk about vaccine efficacy, which is a different, a different figure where we see who gets the vaccine and which, how many of those actually get the infection. But what we're looking at is virologically speaking, we appear to have a good match. And I think that's an important message. That's a message I've been giving my patients because sometimes they, they hesitate and they say, oh, well, it doesn't really work. And in the past, you know, they've guessed and they've guessed wrong. And so we have good reason to believe that this year we have guessed right. The flu epidemic is uh, impressive. And now is a good time to get the vaccine, which appears to be a good match this year. And so that's what I'm telling my patients. Next slide. Uh, so in summary, we do have treatment for COVID and flu. And so people should be aware of that, particularly if they have conditions that predispose them to getting severe COVID or flu. But prevention is best. Uh, there's the, the flu vaccine, which appears to have a great match this year. There's the new recommendations for folks who are 65 years or older with regards to the flu vaccine. And finally, and we just heard about the bivalent COVID vaccine, which can be administered to individuals five years of age or older. Next slide. Uh, so let's see, I've got three minutes. So I'm actually gonna skip this uh, treatment of COVID only to say that uh, we've lost our monoclonal antibody, beptilopamab, that we were using for treatment of COVID. And that is because the uh, circulating variants, the BQ1.1 and the BQ.1, I think that's what they're called, um, they, don't, they are not neutralized by beptilovimab or by the monoclonal antibody because of mutations in the spike protein. And so that's actually been taken out of our arsenal, the top one. And so when well, we still do have the bottom three, Paxovid, molnupiravir, and remdesivir available to us for treatment of COVID. And so I'm going to skip actually the next few slides because they're They've already been addressed and 
are not as relevant. And I want to get to some of the travel. Next slide. Great. OK, so for those of us who have relatives, friends, or whose parents are traveling over the holidays, uh, I get lots of questions about how to travel safely in the time of COVID, flu, and RSV. Next slide. And so these are sort of some of the questions. Is it, comf is it worth it to wear an MA5? Where is it best to sit on an airplane? Is it safe to go to that conference? Uh, I say 40 other people, but like, I think my husband's at a conference right now with 20,000 people. Um, can I get a prescription for Paxlovid and just have it with me just in case? Should I be wearing gloves? Is it okay to share food in the time of COVID? Next slide. So we have good data to show that no mask is the worst. Worst cloth mask is maybe somewhat better, but no longer recommended. So we should we should throw all those away or make them into a quilt. Uh, surgical masks and then respirators are of course the best. So I think it really comes down to a personal choice. If 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 you are immune compromised or at risk for getting severe COVID and you plan to go into a crowded situation, I think it makes sense to wear a respirator. But otherwise, if you are not and you are fully vaccinated, um, yeah, you know, you're not immune compromised. No reason to believe you didn't respond to the vaccine then no mask or a surgical mask, it's a personal choice, but to, to be aware that the mask does provide a level of protection, no doubt, and that the respirator is better than a surgical mask. Next slide. Where to sit on an airplane? I think we've seen this graph before. This was from the National Geographic. Uh, and the conclusion of this uh, article was that it's best to choose a window seat because people aren't gonna be, people with COVID aren't gonna be walking up and down the aisle right next to you and that the chances, fiscal likelihood that you will come into contact with somebody who, uh, who has a respiratory infection is lower. Uh, so this is all theoretical though. I mean, I'm not saying that everybody wants this to run out and get a window seat and that the aisle seats or the middle seat should be empty. But if you wanted to take this into consideration, this, this study is out there. Next slide. And there are experts also who say that it's safer to be on an airplane than it is to be in other indoor situations because of the HEPA filters that airplanes use, the way that air flows from top to bottom, and how frequently the cabin air is refreshed. It may be safer you know, to be on an airplane than it is to be in your kid's classroom. Next slide. What about that conference? You know, the answer is no, not safe. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it's safe if you're vaccinated. Um, of course, and, and you can choose to wear a mask, but there is definitely a level of risk if you're going to go into a crowded situation, a crowded indoor situation um, compared to staying at home. And it's, so it's a risk benefit analysis that uh, each of us has to make for ourselves based on our own level of risk and our, um, our under, any underlying medical conditions that we may have. Next slide. Can I get a prescription of Paxlovid to take with me just in case? I get this question about three times a day from worried patients. Uh, the answer is no, uh, because it's currently under EUA, the uh, emergency use authorization. So we prescribers are bound by uh, the, the regulations of the EUA. Whether it is FDA approved, uh, then we of course can write for it off label. That is a different story. That's probably gonna happen soon, but currently I cannot write you a prescription for Paxlovid to take with you on your safari to Africa, just in case you get COVID. Next slide. Oh, that's just the EUA. So um, yeah, going to Africa is not on there. Okay. Uh, what about a fomite? So uh, the fomite is an inanimate object that could potentially transmit a, a germ. So a tabletop, a pen that you're sharing, uh, you know, a door handle, all of those would be considered to be fomites. And the question is, you know, can you get COVID, RSV, or flu from a fomite? And the answer is yes, but not enough that it's probably worth worrying about as long as you wash your hands a lot. So it really depends on how much virus there is and also on environmental conditions. So for example, if you were to touch a doorknob that had like a blob of mucus on it from somebody who had the flu, and then you were to scratch your nose, yeah, that would be like a perfect storm situation, you know, which yes, you could get flu in because you've got the blob of mucus that's protecting the flu virus in it, keeping it warm and moist. And then you immediately touch your nose and, and that has the the respiratory epithelium that the flu can glom onto. Um, that's different from, of course, whether if you scratch your back where you don't really think that the, the cells of the back don't really absorb the flu virus. So it depends on a lot of things. And I would say that overall it is unlikely. There are viruses that are much more transmiss transmissible by fomites than these respiratory viruses. You know, for example, norovirus, which causes gastroenteritis or herpes. 
which is a DNA virus that's very hardy outside of the body. So flu, RSV, and COVID, not so hardy outside of the body and really need to be exposed to respiratory epithelium. So possible, but not likely, not enough, I think, to change your behavior, except to say, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Next slide. And, uh, you know, I'm Asian, so what about sharing food? Yeah, we love to share food. Um, sharing food, not a great idea from, I'm an infectious diseases doctor, buffets, ID docs don't love buffets, but not really for respiratory viruses. So like I said, there are viruses that can be transmitted that way, in particular, some of the intestinal viruses. Uh, but in terms of COVID, you're more at risk, you know, by the guy you're, you're sharing the food with, you know, coughing in your face than you are by actually, you know, picking out of the same hot pot as shown in this picture. So if you are having people over for, for, for dinner, for the holidays, and you wanna provide lots and lots of serving utensils, that's always a good idea, but only to be aware that that's really not because of COVID, it's because of other things that you're trying to prevent transmission for, and that it's, COVID is more likely to be transmitted by you know, standing next to someone and talking to them. Next slide. And so in conclusion, um, what part of travel prevents the greatest vulnerability? Definitely indoor spaces. What can I do to keep myself safe? Up to date with vaccination is the number one most important thing. Mask, that is optional, it's a personal choice. Um, I would say it's a great idea to travel with rapid tests for COVID available to you so that if you were to have symptoms, you can make an early diagnosis and also kind of think about where you would go to get treatment. Obviously, if you're in New York City, there are many places you can go. Uh, if you're in rural Vietnam, not so much. So maybe, you know, to have that plan, at least to think about, well, where would I go if I were to get COVID? As I said, frequent hand washing, can't emphasize that en enough. And what can I do to keep others safe? Well, just don't go if you're having symptoms, don't go to that gathering, not a good idea. If you have to go, wear a mask to protect others. And then uh, I think it's a good idea if you're going to visit somebody who's elderly or who's immune compromised, test before you go. It's not a guarantee that you won't transmit COVID, but it helps to reduce the likelihood. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Wong. And we did have one question in the question and answer box, which is do smokers of either commercial tobacco or marijuana products have a higher risk of contracting any of these respiratory viruses? I don't think that that is known, but I would say that people who have chronic lung disease are at risk for doing worse if they were to transmit or were to uh, get the virus. So that's a different question, but but I, I would still say that if you have chronic lung disease, uh, then you know you are at increased risk of severe COVID or severe flu. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and finally, we'll have Darnell Aparizio from Lake County Tribal Health Consortium. Welcome, Darnell. Thanks for joining. Thank you very much, um, Darnell Aparicio, and I will be discussing a public health approach to combating inf infectious disease. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just on the agenda today, we're going to discuss the introduction, what is COVID-19, uh, the timeline uh, that we dealt with here in California and in our rural community, and uh, how to deal with the topic of RSV influenza and COVID-19. And then, um, thank you. So what is uh, COVID-19? And uh, by now we should be pretty updated on what that is, but uh, I'll just go through brief topics. COVID-19 is a respiratory illness caused by a type of virus called the coronavirus. The novel new coronavirus was first discovered in Wuhan, China, which is thought to be the origin that's still under discussion and debate on January 31st. 2020, Health and Human Service Secretary uh, declared a public health emergency for the United States. Uh, the problem today, we are inundated with a plethora of new flu and RSV cases. Both viruses pose potential and additional threats to the healthcare system as emergency departments and healthcare facilities are becoming overwhelmed by the conundrum of all three viruses. Next slide, please. So this is a very large timeline. Um, I'm not going to touch on every single topic because it would take a lot of our time and as I only have so much time to speak today. Um, but starting for us, the first thing that we did in March of 2020, after we realized that, you know, uh, COVID-19 had reached the United States, you know, starting in January, 
Uh, we, we established the standard operating procedure for our clinic and um, we were the first to do so. Many facilities outside of uh, our facility, uh, including hospitals and public health departments, uh, came to our facility to utilize our standard operating procedure as a gold standard and uh, helped implement some of those procedures within their own facilities. And in, uh, again, in March, uh, we announced that we had to suspend services for transportation for out-of-county services. Uh, we started seeing uh, a few cases in different areas. And continuing on in March, uh, we, we set up a screening booth at the front entrance, which we still use today. We still maintain a uh, masking protocol within our facility. Um, and then in April, we saw the first positive case in Lake County. And then something that was really cool, thank you, IHS, uh, we received uh, the Abbott Gen Expert. It's RT-PCR, reverse transcriptase polymer chain reaction uh, machine. It allowed us the ability to control a portion of the pandemic utilizing real-time efforts. Uh, at that time, when we were really inundated with a lot of uh, cases, one of the things that we kept on seeing were uh, seven to 10 day lag times. This allowed us to be able to screen uh, patients for not only flu, uh, COVID, RSV, uh, it was influenza A and B. Um, we were able to screen them for all of that uh, in 40 minutes. Uh, August 12th of 2020, we received a respiratory clinic. We set that up. August 13th, we did the walkthrough and we went through the protocol for how to utilize that clinic. Next slide, please. August of 2020, we began the use of the respiratory clinic. I just went through that. Uh, September, we began to see a sharp rise in COVID-19 cases. November 26, things really got real. Uh, we began to receive a lot of calls uh, on the evening of the 26th. And the thing is, we usually shut down for about four days uh, while we go into our holidays. Uh, to allow us time with our families. Uh, by the 27th, uh, we connected with Lake County Public Health. Um, we alerted them to a public health uh, crisis that there was an outbreak in, in within one tribe that actually extended out to the five counties. Uh, we tested a total of 167 patients and received 158 positive results, about a 93% positivity, positivity ratio. December, we followed up with mass testing with additional testing clinics. Uh, we continued on December 16th. On December 17th, uh, we also closed down during the holidays uh, for Christmas for a few days. And uh, we established a CERT COVID emergency response team to help combat the virus uh, of COVID-19 if we saw ourselves in that situation again with a very large outbreak during the holidays. Uh, January began, we delivered our inoculation rollout with the staff. January 11th, we began our patient inoculations with native patients only. At that time, we were very limited. We had only received a thousand doses. Uh, I think everybody in the country was limited at this time, um, which means that we only had 500 primers and 500 boosters. Uh, February 20th, you can see here, the whole entire parking lot's full. We began our mass inoculation rollout where we were uh, able to inoculate the rest of the population that we serve. We are FQHC, uh, Financially Qualified Health uh, Clinic. Um, and on any given day, we were averaging about 270 people that we were able to inoculate in a day. My, so just to give you perspective, we're very rural. And in our county, uh, the amount of patients that we serve is uh, roughly 10,000. So to be able to do that in such a short, like about a three hour period of time was pretty good. We felt pretty well about that. Uh, we were averaging about 100 people an hour that we were able to inoculate. Uh, June through September, this is when things got really rough. Uh, we began to see a sharp increase in the Delta variant. Uh, we saw a steep increase in the Delta variant in July. And then August, we were inundated with those patients who had experienced the Delta variant and were severely ill. By September, the Delta began to taper off. However, it already did its damage. Next slide, please. This mobile clinic that you see here, we received in 2022. Uh, this is our mobile clinic and it has two patient exam rooms equipped with a refrigerator, restroom, built-in backup generator. Uh, this mobile unit is utilized to administer vaccines to tribes within our localized area. The area that we live in is in a very rural, is very rural. And so each tribe is located within 110 mile radius. 
And uh, as you can see, we were servicing one of the tribes here on this day. I believe this was the 28th of October and we were administering COVID bivalent and uh, flu vaccines. Next slide, please. So how to deal with it? Uh, one way to get it in front of things is to utilize testing, uh, inoculations, uh, encourage masking, understanding the stigma of vaccine hesitancy within tribal partnerships. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Um, and, you know, many different tribes that I encounter have um, their stigma is, oh, it's the government or it's possibly, you know, like they're not really understanding because they believe that the uh, vaccine is so new. Uh, one of the things I have to remind them that it is an mRNA vaccine and uh, mRNA, anything to do with mRNA was sort of uh, derived from CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9, uh, and that was about nine or 10 years ago. So it's not really new. It's something that they wanted to utilize. Uh, and starting in 2021 was the first time that we gained authorization to be able to utilize an mRNA. Um, so I feel very confident about that. Next slide, please. This is uh, some of our work that we're doing in the community. Um, it's a couple of individuals. This is us utilizing the van. Uh, one of the ways that, one of the things I like to say is uh, the way to get started is to quit and talk, quit talking and begin doing. And this is us doing. Uh, next slide, please. So for families, um, and it's been covered in all topics. Uh, we pretty much covered it throughout uh, the whole course of today's discussion. Uh, I'd like to reiterate and emphasize what uh, the, under, the other presenters were saying today. Mm -hmm. Influenza and RSV is something that I'll discuss. Uh, today with influenza in California, we are seeing some of the highest numbers that we have seen in two decades. RSV is also on the rise and it presents what we would refer to as a triple demic. I would strongly encourage those that want to gather to try to do their best to refrain from doing so. COVID, RSV, and influenza all thrive in an enclosed and non-ventilated area. The weather is cold, which leads to more exposure and less social distancing while enclosed in a home setting. If you plan to gather, I will strongly urge masking to avoid exposure of droplets from possibly infected family members. If you plan to travel by plane, I also encourage masking to avoid long-term exposure. This use of single plates and spoons is encouraged as well to try to avoid handling foam mites. Uh, reiterating what Dr. Wong said, sources of infection also, although low risk is involved, still likely. Single use cups with names printed on them with the Sharpie is encouraged as well. At Lake County Tribal Health, we still follow mask uh, mandates to date, we have not experienced any significant outbreaks. Most employees who have encountered COVID-19 or influenza have done so through community transmission, families, friends, social gatherings, etc. Next slide, please. In summary, we described methods to be useful in a clinical setting or in a communal setting. We have discussed standard precautions to be utilized when gathering. And for those that plan to travel, we summarize the timeline of events that led to a proactive effort. We have summarized uh, successful partnerships with state agencies that assisted us with distribution of inoculations and testing efforts. Uh, one of the things I'd like to uh, cover and converge on here is because we are so rural, uh, one of the things that we see a lot of is uh, sort of like a three month lag time from whatever happens on the East Coast. So if something's happening on the East Coast, we begin to see that lag time carry over uh, into uh, our area about three months later. So we have a little bit of time to prepare as I've been monitoring uh, the situations as they occur. Uh, we have a little bit more time to prepare for these events prior to their arrival. Uh, next slide, please. And thank you very much, everybody, for having me today. Uh, really appreciate it. Really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to you. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than glad to answer some of those for you if I could, as well as the rest of the presenters. Thank you very much. You guys have a great day. Thanks so much, Darnell. Really appreciate you sharing your perspective and um, your experience with addressing these infectious diseases in your health center.
And uh, just for in the interest of time, we are going to uh, skip over the live Q&A portion just because we haven't had any additional questions. But um, I'm going to pass it back over to Darby to close us out. Great, thank you so much. And I will actually go ahead and pass it to Dree for final notes. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, just some use and reactions, using your reactions. If today's call was beneficial to you, your team, your household, can you let us know using the reactions on the bottom of the screen? A thumbs up, a hand clap, a high five, a parade because we wanna make sure that we acknowledge our speakers and we wanna also acknowledge the fact that this was a call that you are requested upon us. And it's our job to meet the needs of our communities that we work in. And so to follow up with that, there was a question about CEs in the box and speakers, these hearts and praise is for you because the work that you all are doing to A, Cara, John, Darby and myself, this is a thank you to you, as well as to all of the people that attended this call that are working in public health. All of you are frontline public health professionals. If you are mom, you are the nurse and the doctor in your house. If you're the dad, you are the nurse and the doctor in that house. Teachers, you are the providers in those classrooms. So this material is relevant, it is important, and I thank you all for taking the time to join us today to share this information and all of the presentation slides will be given to you. Your community health workers, your community health representatives are um, approved to use any data that was shared, any clinical hospitals that would like to pull from these to maybe do a pull report on your patient population, you are approved to do so to get this education and awareness out because it's a triple threat out there. And you know, you don't have COVID, you gotta worry about food. If you ain't worried about food, you gotta worry about your babies or yourself with RSV. So definitely, 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 Please keep in mind to always wash your hands. You cough into your arm, cough into your shirt. Make sure that you're telling your babies this, your teenagers this, your college kids this. When you in the classroom, on the plane, this holiday season, please remember to try to keep your space, cover your coughs, drink your water, keep a positive attitude, because I'm old fashioned. I think how you feel also influences your health. And if you love these presentations, the National Indian Health Board is having an infectious disease institute in Seattle, Washington. I am going to try to pull my co-presenters, Cara, to them to come in. I love Dr. Wan's presentation. So if she can steal a way to maybe do a deeper dive into infectious diseases and how it impacts us, then let's do that because we want this to be a peer learning community. If you are interested in attending the Infectious Disease Institute, the National Indian Health Board do have scholarships available to assist with travel. This is a free event, free. All you have to do is get approval from your leadership, from your program managers, from your husbands, from your kids, to still away for two days. The Institute, again, is in Seattle, Washington, February the 28th through March the 2nd. A uh, save a date will go out to all of those that register. Also, Darnell is presenting during this Institute. So although he had to minimize his presentation today, he will be a full breakout speaker doing the Infectious Disease Institute where he would do a deeper dive into building those relationships with the state as well as the tribe because he is a tribal liaison and then being able to talk about those cultural values. When you work in public health, but you're also native, how do we merge those things? Because you can't leave one at home. We may try, but you can't. So 100%. We hope that you enjoyed this. Please complete that evaluation. We need to know what other topics. If there was something that was said today and you need follow-up clarity, you need a one-on-one -on -one call with CDC, please let us know so that we can provide that TA to get that going. If there's resources that you need, PPE, um, you need like some care kits that come with masks and gloves, please let us know those in those evaluations. We are here to serve you.
to help you combat and fight against the triple threat this holiday season, which is COVID. And I should have made that poll question. COVID-19, RSV, and flu. So without anything else, I will turn it over to Cara to close us out. Again, thank you for attending. Thank you to my speakers. Please be on the lookout for the Save the Date. And most importantly, please complete those evaluations and let us know what more information we can do for you. And you sign up for the Institute um, after we get the page up and going. We are providing CEs for the, for the Institute. So you will be able to start registering the first week in January. Save the dates will go out next week, as well as your opportunity to start applying for our scholarships. And the save the date will go out next week. So by next Friday, which would be December 16th, the Institute is February the 28th. All right, thank you all. Turn it back over to Car to close us out. Great, thanks, Dre. And thanks to all for joining us today. I know we went a few minutes over, but I really appreciate you all hanging in there with us. And uh, as mentioned, the evaluation is really critical and any unanswered questions that you have remaining from today, you can ask in the evaluation and we'll make sure to follow up on those. The evaluation will pop up as soon as you leave the session and it will also be included in the follow-up email along with the recording and the slides via Zoom to all registrants on Friday. And uh, additionally, if you prefer to access recordings of this session or podcasts, we'll have those sessions available on Monday at our website, um, bit.ly slash churn resources. So we will make sure that y'all get a, access to those. And without further ado, I'll let y'all get out of here and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks so much and take good care. And Justice, um, can you, J Justice Beard, I see you have a question. Can you please type your email in the chat box and we'll have Dr. Wong or Emily follow up with you about your question with the dry, with the dry throats and the heat that I see in the chat. You asked that question twice. And I have that JM Beard one. All right, and we'll follow up in email. Thank you.